Mike Braun emerges the victor from a bruising Senate primary. Joe Donnelly says he's ready for a fight. That plus Trump comes to Indiana for party unity and more on Indiana Week in Review for the week ending May 11th, 2018. Ice Miller is proud to support Indiana Week in Review. Ice Miller, with a 100-year tradition of learning what is important to clients and strategizing with them toward a common goal. Today, Ice Miller continues its commitment to help clients build, grow, and protect their interests. More at icemiller.com. This week, Indiana Republicans chose their Senate candidate, businessman, and former state lawmaker, Mike Braun. The Senate Republican primary was marked by divisive attacks among each candidate, but as he secured a double-digit victory, Mike Braun struck a conciliatory tone, saying he hopes opponents Luke Messer and Todd Rakita come on board. Our, our common goal all along was to retire Joe Donnelly. Messer's concession speech made no mention of Braun. Todd Rakita congratulated Braun, sort of. I hope he will rise to the occasion and truly fight for this state. I know he has it in him and not just wave an expense, wage an expensive media campaign to buy a Senate seat only to keep Washington at the status quo. What does Braun's comfortable victory tell us about the mood of the electorate? It's the first question for our Indiana Week in Review panel. Democrat Elise Schrock, Republican Mike O'Brien, John Schwann is the host of Indiana Lawmakers, and political analyst John Ketzenberger. I'm Indiana Public Broadcasting Statehouse reporter Brandon Smith. Elise. Was this a message to those already serving in D.C.? Well, look, we saw voters in 2016, Hoosier voters, um, overwhelmingly vote for some kind of change, right? That's, that's, that was largely that what was election. behind that yeah. election. And um, now that they have it, I'm not sure, um, especially Midwesterners and Hoosiers are necessarily apt to sign up for the chaos and controversy that we've seen um, come from federal level Republicans. So is it a referendum on DC Republicans? Maybe, yeah. Is it a referendum on DC Republicans? If it was a referendum on picking an outsider, they picked an outsider, you know, just like they did in 2016. So that's consistent. Um, you know, I, I, you had Todd Rakita, who also tried to run as an outsider, which is like much harder when you, if you have congressman as your first name. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to, to, to do that. Um, but look, Mike Braun ran a great campaign. He won, he won handily, but he ran a really good campaign. I mean, that can't be lost in this. I know the, uh, it's easy for the, you know, to discount that a lot of money was spent, and a lot of money is going to be spent. This is gonna be, I mean, there's people that think this could be a $100 million U.S. Senate race, so, I mean, this is not going to be a, you know, a cheap affair over the next, uh, the next six months, and he won, he won by a lot, and he won because he had, I think, the message right now that fit, fit the time. A lot of people are, are speculating that this was, again, choosing the outsider, choosing the non-establishment, but 60% of Hoosier Republicans voted for a sitting congressman. I guess you could frame it that way in a three-way race. Uh, Hat tip, by I, the way, to Ed Feigenbaum for pointing that out. That's <laughs> their credit where credit is due. I thought you were going to point out this is my first of my 12 uh, erroneous predictions from last week. So, <laughs> so let's uh, let's start and just no, keep that's going right. downhill from I'm here. Just gonna, I'm just going to move past it. We'll move it's right fine. past it. Um, I think if you look at not just Indiana as your as your uh, laboratory and trying to assess or analyze what happened here or what the mood is of the electorate. And you look more broadly at where other incumbents in the U.S. House ran for office uh, or were defeated in, I should say, in the primary, North Carolina, West Virginia. Then you start to see a broader pattern of a general frustration with Congress. And I think um, uh, it's this, it's what's been building for a long time, the sense that that there, there's gridlock, that nothing can get done, the hyperpartisanship. Um, of course, it's the primaries probably uh, that help fuel the, the hyperpartisanship because that does tend to accentuate the uh, ideology both on the left and the right. But uh, that tidbit notwithstanding about the 60%, I still think this, uh, this was not, uh, well, incumbency is not necessarily a, a, your undoing. It's not the. It's not. It's not the as much as it's not the gravy to. train it used to be. Was this anti-incumbency or was this two, uh, two not incumbents but two establishment politicians splitting yeah, the I vote? Th I think the sample, if you look just at Indiana, is a little bit difficult to make a prediction because you do have two sitting congressmen running against each other, uh, and and a third who's a former state legislator, 
Um, and that's just unusual. Um, usually those things will get sorted out or you'll only have one incumbent or something like that. It's an unusual circumstance, I think, given, given the way we had it this year. But I think um, there is something afoot, uh, whether it's anti-incumbency. Uh, but I think an important note is that there were a lot of women who won in all kinds of primaries on both sides of the aisle uh, in all four states the other night. And I think that that's something we're probably going to see more of, and that's great. I think yeah. it's interesting to bring more people into the process. This is an exercise at the end of the day in these primaries of picking the, the best person from a party standpoint, who you think is going to line up the best. And Mike Braun, no doubt. I mean, he, he doesn't bring any of this. Uh, he has no D.C. voting record. He doesn't bring any of that no. kind of baggage with him. And so I think Republican voters went and picked the right guy who can run most effectively against Joe Donnelly and his record. And to John's point, we, Indiana has a record number of women who will be running for the U.S. House this fall. Well, Democratic Senator Joe Donnelly offici officially welcomed Republican Mike Braun this week to what's likely to be one of the most contentious races in the country this fall. Indiana's Senate Republican primary was dubbed one of the nastiest in the nation. Joe Donnelly says he hopes the general election campaign will focus on issues, including health care and tax reform. But he says he's also ready to defend himself and his record. If somebody wants to take a, a, a swing at me, I'll be right there to fight back. If somebody wants to throw a fastball at my head, I've played a lot of baseball. I'm ready to go in the other direction, too. Mike O'Brien, does a negative campaign, which this very likely could be, does it help Donnelly or Braun more? A negative campaign is always a matter of perspective, <laughs> right? So I mean, if Joe Donnelly wants to talk about health care and voting against a tax cut for Hoosiers, then I don't think he's going to like the, the message uh, that, that he's going to be facing uh, in the fall. So. I think there'll be plenty. There's going to be plenty. There's going to be a lot of different layers to this. We're going to see a lot of outside money, um, which is never positive. Um, but I think we have two guys that have a pretty deep background in Indiana, uh, and do and both do bring uh, you know a perspective that deserves to be debated. So I think, yeah, and just the, by nature, these two guys aren't evil guys. You know, by nature, they're not going to like choose and want to run a vicious kind of uh, personal, personally negative campaign. But if you want to talk about issues and you think that's negative. That's just a matter of perspective on what kind of end of the stick you wind up on. And I think specifically with uh, health care and taxes were mentioned, if you're Joe Donnelly, I don't think you're in the right, uh, you're not on the side of the majority of Hoosiers right now. Joe Donnelly laid those out for, I mean, that's what he wants the race to be about. He wants it to be about the health care debate. He wants it to be about the tax reform debate. Is that going to be a winning strategy? Yeah, I think it is. And I think... Um any chance we have to talk about his record, you're right about perspective, even though I share a different one from you, right. clearly. That's right. See, that's what um, I'm talking about. I can, think it's negative. She but thinks can, I'm negative. But we can talk about, <laughs> you know, 19 legislative proposals that President Trump has signed his own name to and that Joe Donnelly has passed. He has a record of bipartisanship. Uh, the Luger Center has named him the most bipartisan senator serving in 25 years. So um, if we want to talk about Joe Donnelly's record, he'll be ready for it. Does a negative campaign, if this becomes a negative campaign, as I mean, again, to your point, yeah, Mike Braun is not a guy who will automatically go there, but that's what we saw in the Senate GOP primary. It might go there again, and Donnelly says he's willing to fight back. Does that help him, or does it help Braun? I don't think it helps anybody. Uh, what it does that is, wasn't one of the choices, well, John. Well, I'm taking a different <laughs> choice, because the truth is it doesn't help either candidate. It, it sullies both. Uh, and what it does is it takes out the people who uh, are in the middle who are um, trying to decide, do I like this person's positions or this person's positions? And then they throw their hands up and say, the heck with it. It's a mess. It won't matter. And that's what negative campaigning does. And so if this goes negative, it probably favors uh, Mike Braun because of the, just the base of Republican uh, voters in the state is deeper than the base for Democrat voters. Uh, but... Um, you know, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it does play out because it will go negative. It's just how, how will it go negative? Will it be as personal as we saw the primary or will it be more of the aerial attacks uh, from the outside money? And um, I think that'll make a bit of a difference, but I'm, I'm not optimistic. Uh, if it's a low turnout vote, I think that helps Braun. Um, and, and I think that's what negative campaigning does. Well, I want to get the negativity started. Joe Donnelly used a baseball metaphor in <laughs> basketball-crazed Indiana. Is he out of touch with Hoosiers? <laughs> hey, there, there's some successful baseball teams. I mean, if I were a shareholder of the uh, Indianapolis Indians back way back when, I'd be sitting on a beach uh, in Tahiti <laughs> right now. But uh, 
you can't go wrong with sports metaphors. Uh, if you get a, if, yes, you can. Well, you can <laughs> if you if, if, if you talk we'll about the basketball about the basketball yeah. ring. But generally speaking, <laughs> um, just one thing about the negativity. Even if these candidates, and you're right, I think that they are individuals who, by nature, are willing to focus on issues and and the positive aspects of, of public service. But that may not matter because, as Mike suggested, the money is going to be pouring in from all of the outside, the independent organizations, right. so-called independent organizations. And I, they're not going to sp pump their money into a race just to say nice, positive things about people. They tend to tear people down. Right. And I don't think voters distinguish necessarily whether that's coming from a candidate or from an independent uh, organization. As we, as we may have seen in the 4th District, race, which we'll be talking about soon. Well, time now for viewer feedback. Each week we pose an unscientific online poll question in conjunction with our Ice Miller email and text alerts. This week's question, will Republican Mike Braun beat Democratic Senator Joe Donnelly this fall? A, yes. B, no, or C, it's too early to tell. I think we'll be asking that question again at some point in the future. Well, last week's question, who will win Indiana's Republican U.S. Senate primary? 44% said Mike Braun, 25% said Luke Messer, 30% said Todd Rakita. I hope too many didn't cheat and vote after the election results were in. If you would like to take part in the poll, go to WFYI.org slash IWIR and look for the poll. Well, President Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence came to Elkhart this week for a political event aimed in part at boosting the state's new Republican Senate candidate. At the political event originally set for South Bend but moved to Elkhart ostensibly for a larger venue, Vice President Pence and President Trump praised Senate candidate Mike Braun. And they attacked incumbent Democrat Joe Donnelly, with Trump debuting a new derisive nickname for the Hoosier senator. Sleeping Joe. Trump told the large crowd he needs more reinforcements in Washington, people like Braun he calls swamp drainers, rather than Donnelly, who Trump says does whatever Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer tell him to do. Donnelly says he doesn't work for any party or president, but for Hoosiers. John Katzenberger, is Sleepin' Joe going to catch on? Does anybody else remember Mexico Joe? Or, or do nothing, do, Donnelly. Or, yeah, we talk about that Donnelly, out here too, which at least has alliteration going for it. <laughs> um, look, these nicknames are a, a crummy trend in politics, um, and it's because the president has a, a habit of uh, tagging people with them. Sometimes, what was it? Ronald Reagan used to give out uh, nicknames. They weren't usually as well distributed, but if you got one, it was a good thing. In this case, it's an attempt to denigrate somebody. It's a sign of the times, <clears throat> and it's an unfortunate sign of the times. Uh, this will mean nothing at the time, you know, by the time we vote in November. That's the first big thing that Mike Braun does after the primary, and obviously it's about party unity after a bruising primary, but a, the conventional wisdom, as we often talk about in this show, being that you have to hew a little bit more to the center than you did in the primary, does appearing next to Donald Trump help you in that regard? Uh, he must feel that that's the strategy that, that got him this far and that he will continue down that path. Now. Uh, this is not a static situation. We have some things happening in Washington. Who's to say whether uh, hitching oneself to the, the Trump you know, wagon uh, could turn out to be a good thing or a very bad thing? Uh, because in, this is an eternity in political time. Yeah, uh, six months. Uh, well, as you say every week, a lot of things can happen in an <laughs> Indiana, Indiana week. week. So true. just think what could happen now in a national X number of months. Uh, so, yeah, it's... Um, uh, I, I don't think, besides, you, I don't, if he's going to tack to the middle and, and, and distance himself from Donald Trump, probably not going to do it the first week. <laughs> and they'll just have a little bit of, uh, you know, adjustment uh, so that it doesn't shock his supporters who, who may have been motivated by that support. Do these punches on Joe Donnelly land at all? Well, I think they do, yeah. I think they... Um uh, one, this is a, uh, Donald Trump is motivating both sides to go out and vote, <laughs> right? So, I mean, he's still popular wildly, as we saw in the uh, uh, pre-primary, um, you know, the messages from these Republican campaigns in the pre-primary. He's wildly popular among Republicans. Um, he's wildly unpopular among Democrats who are now motivated to go out. I mean, they're, they're less excited about Joe Donnelly than they are about being against Trump, just generally. Um, you know, so it kind of comes down, it's a midterm, it kind of comes down to What's, who, shows up. who gets their people out? Who's best organized? And what does what does turnout look like? And and swinging at Joe Donnelly like Trump is early. I mean, it's going to galvanize. That was a huge crowd up in Elkhart. I mean, people waited in line for hours to get into that thing. We, we don't see that. For I mean, we're just not seeing that 
So I mean, both sides are energized, and I don't think that's ever talked. I don't think that's talked about. Yeah. Is that is that is I that mean, exactly what this is? First of all, that, speaking of energy, that was a very low energy dig, Sleeping Joe, and it's also laughable um, because whether or not you agree with him. Uh, Joe Donnelly is one of the most hard-working elected officials I think you're ever going to meet. Uh, in 2017 alone, he hit over 500 different um, events across the state in the last four years. He's hit uh, all 92 counties each year. Um, he's out there with the people. Um, his staff from top to bottom is incredible. I hear people from both sides of the aisle or no side at all talk about how helpful they've been. Um, under uh, the senator's leadership. So um, I think to say that he's not a hardworking person is pretty laughable. And, um, you know, our base is pretty diverse, and we've seen everyone step behind Joe Donnelly. Um, I think we're ready to fight for him, and um, I, I think everyone's ready to step behind him because we know that he's anything but sleeping. Well, that, that hardworking talking point is something that comes straight from. Todd Rokita, which I'm sure you agree with on a lot of things. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, stay, uh, as, as I talked about earlier, State Representative Jim Baird scored what some consider a surprise victory this week in the Republican primary for Indiana's fourth congressional seat, the seat opened by Todd Rokita's Senate run. Baird emerged from a seven-person primary field, one which included former Mike Pence staffer Diego Morales and former state rep and Department of Workforce Development Commissioner Steve Braun, who was considered the favorite in the race. Baird is a farmer, small business owner, and a Vietnam veteran who served four terms at the State House. But in the wake of his victory, Baird told the Lafayette Journal Courier if Rokita wanted to go back to running for his congressional seat, he'd be willing to talk. His campaign quickly walked back those comments. John Schwannis, does Jim Baird really want to serve in Congress? I think once the dust settled and he emerged from his uh, sleepless, chaotic night, he, uh, he saw, saw the wisdom of uh, maybe uh, the cakewalk that, that awaits him in all likelihood in the general election. I mean, that's a heavily Republican district, as we've seen uh, in the past. Um, I, I think he was shocked more than anything. I, I think he probably uh, saw it as an uphill battle. But I don't think you can put him in the category of candidates who just, you know, hey, it'll be cool if I'm on the ballot, and I'll tell my grandkids, look, you're, there's your grandpa or grandma on the ballot. Uh, we do see that from time to time, but he uh, six, took... Yeah, six-term state house rep. That's... Well, and he lent himself, uh, I think it was, what, a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, at one point in the campaign, and I doubt you're, you're wanting to tap that kind of... I guess it'll all be... Pay back come out in the wash now, now but, uh, <laughs> I mean, without it that being in, a given that that money would be coming back, that's $200,000 worth of serious, I, I would say. Yeah, do you think this is just election night chaos and it caught him at a bad moment? Or not a bad well, moment. I think they caught him at a moment where he was um, very busy accepting the congratulations of everyone. I'm sure he was on a very high emotional plane. Um, you know, it was a close victory. It was a hard-fought victory. It got a little ugly at the end with a mailer against him. Uh, so I'm sure that he was pretty euphoric and uh, probably wasn't fully calculating everything he had to say. Um, and so uh, I would be surprised if he was really thinking about that. And uh, I don't think the district would probably respond very well uh, to a change like that right now. John mentioned that mailer, and we talked about that on last week's show, that it was really in poor taste, uh, talking about people having to pay an arm and a leg about a candidate who lost his uh, hand in Vietnam. Do you think that played into Tuesday night's result? Sure. I mean, it was a pretty low blow, even in a particularly nasty GOP primary. Um, but we also have to remember that he's run in the district before. So he already has a base that's naturally going to have um, an idea of who he is, who he served, and who may be defensive for him. What are you, I mean, your fourth district GOP chair? I would hope you know the district a little bit. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, what, what do you make of what a lot of people saw as a surprise victory? Uh, I think the mailer did have a, uh, it, uh, I underestimated how fast it would get around. I mean, I knew like, you it know. It came out, it, what, five days before the five election? Five days before the election. That's hard to make anything out of in that short amount of time. Uh, you can't turn it into a TV ad. You can't turn it into a mail piece. You just don't have time to do any of those things. But just from a grassroots kind of social media standpoint, how fast and how many like times fire. I saw that, it was unbelievable. It was. Um, and especially in what was a relatively close race. Yeah. Um, so you, could, you could certainly say uh, that that was the edge. I think the underlying story here about him not running it's a non-story. I talked to him that night. His wife actually answered his cell phone that night. I just called to congratulate him, and 
uh, part of our conversation was, hey, you just need to kind of go network through the districts. And I was Rakita and you know, just work with him. And I think when, when that reporter called him, it was, you know, he was picking, you know, he was working two phones the whole night because no one expected to win. All these people are calling him to congratulate him. So I think it was just a chaotic night. I think he probably just didn't, wasn't fully engaged yeah. in every conversation he was having with that, that reporter. And, and we woke up the next but morning and went, Rokita well, wait a minute. He wasn't. Yeah, that's <laughs> just what Todd Rokita wants you to believe. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, most incumbents. It's not going to happen. Jim Baird is going to be a congressman. All right, most incumbents, <laughs> unless the Democrats have something to say, most incumbents in state House and Senate races sailed to easy victory this week, with two exceptions. Richmond Republican Representative Dick Ham was dealt a significant defeat in his primary, a 34 percentage point loss to political newcomer Brad Barrett. Barrett is a retired surgeon who says he's passionate about health care issues, including the opioid epidemic. And in northern Indiana, Granger Republican Senator Joe Zakis will leave the legislature after 36 years. He too lost in an upset to challenger Linda Rogers. Rogers is a golf course and home building company owner who's never before held elected office. Elise Schrock, what lessons should we learn, similar to my first question in the first topic, I suppose, what should we learn from these two incumbents going down like this to people who had never even run for office before? Well, I think this is just what happens when you have decades of gerrymandering, right? You have people that are drawn into safe districts. They um, aren't as challenged as they probably should be, and they get comfortable. Um, that you also then have those um, major heated battles brought into the primary because they're happening within the party. And until we get true redistricting reform, I think you can expect to see this a lot more. There were some, we talked about a little on last week's show, there were some uh, state house races that people were kind of eyeing, oh, maybe the incumbent might lose here. I don't think anybody had Dick Ham on there and not a lot of people had Joe Zakis on there. What do we make of these sort of surprise upsets? I'm not sure these were surprises. I mean, mm. um, I think locally the in both of these races, there was kind of an understanding that um, they, that the both the incumbents could lose. Um, I think you have to have a good sense of kind of when it's time to time to move on. I mean, Joe Zach is a good senator and a good representative from that part of the state for a, for a long time, but he was elected when I was two. You know, 36 years is a long time to do anything, right? And so, uh, you know, I think voters just kind of, we, we've seen a lot of, Greg Walker, you know, uh, beat Bob Garten down in Columbus on kind of the same message, you know, it's, it's after a while, it's after just a while, time. you just need, you just kind of need to have a good gut sense of kind of when it's time to, when it's time to go, or when when you you think your constituents are sending you a message. This is the first primary opponent that Joe Zakis had had since 1994, when I was seven. Um, <laughs> was this just a case of a little bit of him being caught off guard? Well, I won't tell you how old I was. In <laughs> <laughs> older than seven. I was older than seven. You've been on the show for like five years at that point. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the best line of the day. Uh, <laughs> It's just, uh, I, yeah, those ex muscles had not been exercised. I mean, when you haven't faced primary challenge, it, it's what Elise says. You just, uh, you get comfortable. You get, uh, you just don't sense that you need to do the things that, that uh, a hungrier candidate uh, might expect to do. Um, and I think that's, that. I wouldn't read, when you get to legislative races, I wouldn't read, you know, global political yeah. trends. I mean, this is not, is it a groundswell for the Republican sentiment or Democratic uh, dogma. No, it's basically, hey, I know so-and-so, he was the high school football coach. Or in the case of, of the victor who beat Dick Ham, uh, as Dick Ham pointed out, uh, here's a former retired uh, surgeon in the winning margin. He was with the Reed Memorial uh, Health Care System in Richmond. I mean, they have enough employees that effectively, if the people who knew him from that context had voted, there's your winning margin right there. And I do think that legislative, that's an oversimplification, but I do think legislative races often come down to those sorts of issues as opposed to the, the, yeah, the we, higher, uh, more ideological types. Do we have to really view these more in isolation? I think so. Um, but one thing, I, I, I picking up on Elisa's point, is the gerrymandering. Um, when you have districts that are assuredly one party or the other, uh, then it becomes an inner party battle and you know people will lay out lay out lay out for so long it's much better for the process to have a competitive district you get a much more responsive and representative person as a result all right well finally Hollywood Casino in Lawrenceburg Indiana this week tweeted and posted on Facebook about the big race coming up later this month as the messages put it 
NASCAR's Indy 500 complete with images of stock car racing. Mike O'Brien, is this the worst Hoosier faux pas than the aforementioned Ted Cruz's basketball ring? If there's, you can't screw basketball up, but you really can't screw up <laughs> yeah. the Indy 500. I mean, you could be the most popular politician in the state, and if you say that, a casino is going to survive. But if you're a politician who says that, you are you done. Are done. <laughs> is the casino going to survive? Just because of the, no, I mean, just, is this about as bad as it can get? It's not good. I mean, <laughs> it's really not good. You, you can't mess with, like Mike said, you can't mess with basketball, and you really, really can't mess Especially with the in world's May. greatest yeah, spectacle in yeah. racing. It's <laughs> not a good time. Um, yeah, it doesn't look good. With a picture of a stock car, no less. Yeah, the, I know, the they doubled down on it. At least it, it wasn't Jeez. a basketball ring. That's right. That's Indiana Week in Review for this week. Our panel is Democrat Elise Schrock, Republican Mike O'Brien, John Schwannis of Indiana Lawmakers, and political analyst John Ketzenberger. If you'd like a podcast of this program, you can find it at wfyi.org slash iwir, or starting Monday, you can stream it or get it on demand from Xfinity and on the new WFYI app. I'm Brandon Smith of Indiana Public Broadcasting. Join us next time, because a lot can happen in an Indiana week. Ice Miller is proud to support Indiana Week in Review. Ice Miller, with a 100-year tradition of learning what is important to clients and strategizing with them toward a common goal. Today, Ice Miller continues its commitment to help clients build, grow, and protect their interests. More at icemiller.com.